Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 207, 208, and 209. In these episodes, the crew lands on a weird island where everything is really long, and then they get roped into this weird contest by the Foxy Pirates. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Gabriella for commissioning this episode. <sighs> all right. I have had some computer issues today, folks. Everybody has been very patient. Appreciate you all. Um, and a lot of people are thinking that my computer issues are due to planned obsolescence. And honestly, I would be inclined to agree if it weren't for the fact that my laptop doesn't have any of these issues. I really think this is a genuine hardware problem with Macs, like the desktops, but who knows? Um, but anyway, so first of all, I want to address a couple of things off the top. Gus earlier asks, uh, whether or not I read the chapters that are, if those, those of you who are interested, um, Gus had posted them from the actual manga pinned in the discord chat for one piece, no spoilers. And I did. So I just wanted to let y'all know that I went back and read them. It's kind of funny though, because I felt like I missed so much during the episode where all of these characters were introduced, but reading the chapters that Gus shared didn't feel like it helped all that much. No offense, Gus, because I really appreciate you putting the effort to go find that information. But it really just gave me everybody's like titles. And I still don't really understand what the implications are supposed to be of these people who I because when that episode was covered and Somebody asked me, and it might have been you, Gus, how do you feel about finding out the world is run by like five people? I didn't get that then. And reading the chapters, I still don't entirely get that now. It just feels like we've got five dudes who like are organizing something, but I don't know what any of their goals really are. They aren't even that involved with the actual meeting that we get to see. They're like a completely separate thing. So I feel actually a little better now because I felt like I was missing a major moment. And I am not sure that I'm even really supposed to get it yet. I sort of think I'm just given a brief glimpse of these people and eventually those holes will be filled in and it's just meant to inform me that this is the overall structure that exists, but that I don't need to like understand it yet. And, you know, that, like I said, I feel like a little bit better about it now because with the fact that they weren't translating any of the titles underneath these characters as they were getting introduced, there was a strong sense of I'm missing important stuff. But getting the title of the characters underneath and finding out it's just like, you know, co-admiral of the, the Marines or whatever, doesn't really add anything for me in terms of, of overall information because I don't feel like we've heard any talk about the co-admiral of the Marines being a good or bad person. It's not revealing anything. It's just sort of putting some like pieces on the board that don't actually feel relevant at all right now. And so anyway, I just wanted to mention it because it just, I was really thinking I had missed something a lot more major. And now I'm like, okay, it, it was major. Probably it felt more major to those of you who have a bigger picture idea of what's coming and who are more familiar with this property because you are aware of what the relevance of these people is going to be. But from the perspective that I'm currently at with the information I have and the storyline that I'm on, 
it doesn't feel like relevant at all. And it is a little bit weird that they chose to have that big moment then and then not really refer to it at all until now. And even here in these chapters where we see, what is his name? Do Flamingo show up. He's still very like, it's still unclear what he's doing. And I don't feel like I needed the introduction of a lot of the other big wigs. We could have just had his intro and eased into some other conspiracy type stuff a little bit later. Um, let's see. The Seraphim says, uh, that's looking back at this with full context of things. Not really sure what you'd know for sure the first time. Florian says, it's okay. First time I had no clue who all these people were and what they wanted. Seraphim says, the main point for this was just to show you these guys exist. Make note of them for later. Okay. That's what I was figuring. Gus says, I don't think I was the one to ask. I was just sad you miss people's names and who they are for when they reappear later. I guess the moment is colored by my hindsight quite a bit, but as long as you see the names and titles, you're good. Um, yeah. And just, you know, <laughs> full disclosure, I don't remember a single one of them. So even though I saw them and I saw the dudes like faces, I remain fully confident that when they reappear, I will likely not remember a damn thing. So, you know, they're still pinned. I can go back and find them. Uh, Florian says, sorry, not sorry. I want to hear what you think about the Foxy. I, about Foxy. I will tell you, I promise. Um, Seraphim says, co-admiral, he's the fleet admiral, the guy in charge of the entire Marines. Sure. I mean, I know what that means, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Do you know what I'm saying? The Marines are a real weird force in this series. It's like they just low-key don't exist until we need them to exist, and then they're a whole thing, and then they just disappear again for long periods. So I don't even really know what kind of importance to give that. Um, Gus says the important feelings ones to me... Uh, trying to look at it from a new watcher's perspective are Do Flamingo and Bartholomew Kuma. Both are warlords in the same positions as Mihawk and Crocodile with like 200 to 300 million buried bounties. Yeah. And um, there was a real emphasis on their bounties in the manga and the way that it was like they were presented. So those are really the people that I personally paid attention to because of, of the fact that, if they are warlords, then I assume our guys are going to come in contact with them a lot sooner than any of the other players that we were introduced to. So I paid the most attention to them. Um, Seraphim says, okay, how are you going to forget someone with as fabulous a fashion sense as Do Flamingo? Oh, see, that was the only one that I remembered. Um, Do Flamingo, like his name I didn't remember, but when he shows up and he has that jacket and the glass, he was the only one that I was like, oh, that guy. But honestly, I didn't recall where I knew him from. When he appears in this, I paused and then went and read the things because I was suddenly like, oh, right, I'm supposed to read those. And once I got that refresher, I was like, ah, yes, it's this dude who apparently has the ability to like make people do what he wants, like puppets if I'm not mistaken, which is a really fucked up power that I hate. I just really, that's like, yeah, don't like it. Um, but other than Mihawk, uh, I think he's the only one that I would remember by sight. The one that, uh, the other one that like sort of rang a bell was the dude who's like a mime. And I didn't remember his name or any of his deal. I just saw him and was like, oh, yeah, I remember this, like, weird dude showing up. That's it. Um, Gus says, interesting that his surname is Don Quixote, which is interesting. Yeah. The choices of names that are, like, super referential to other things, I don't – it's so weird because it feels sometimes like he's trying to do something with that. Oda by is who I mean, like by he's trying. And then sometimes I'm like, did you just kind of like lose track of who was named what and just came up with whatever was on? Like, it feels sometimes like he is just sitting next to a bookshelf and he starts a new arc and he's like, and this guy's name is um, uh, Romeo. His name is Romeo Shakespeare. And it just feels like he picks shit out of thin air like that. Um, but anyway, 
So this section starts a brand new arc. What was between this and the last episode was a filler arc. And full disclosure, it has been a bonkers week and a half. And I have not watched the filler arc yet. I plan to watch it tonight because Owen is going to be working really late. And so I have committed myself to giving myself a Manny Petty in front of the television while I watch the filler arc this evening. So by the time I record the next one, I think I am going to uh, be able to talk about it in the next episode a little bit, but I won't take up too much time with it, obviously, because it was a filler. Um, let's see. Gus says, oh, and Blackbeard 2, Marshall D. Teach, who we've heard a lot about. He's the one that Ace is chasing for killing a crewmate on Whitebeard's ship. Right. And Blackbeard is the one that has the weird IV hookups to like Grog, I guess, is the way that's done. It's unclear. Um, Seraphim says, ah, good old long ring, long land. Okay, so Whitebeard is the guy with the Grog. Huh. Okay. Um, Whitebeard seems like a real piece of shit, so bums me out a little bit that Ace is uh, on his side. But what can you do? This island is so weird. So we start the episode off, I should mention, with another fall from the sky with our friend the octopus balloon who they finally release after this and swims away to make friends in the blue sea. I am really surprised that the octopus was still a factor. And I hope that we get to see it again because it's adorable and I kind of want a plushie of it. And the fact that uh, they all seem to be like friendly with it makes me sort of excited about the filler arc because I want to know what the hell this octopus clearly saved their skins in some way. And I am very interested but the whole, like, the fact that they are coming out of the air yet again, I'm just, where, how did you get back up? Like, does the, do they just get lifted away out of, it doesn't matter because I'll know soon, but I just want to ask. And after they land, they get chased by fucking sea monkeys, which, um, I don't really know what to do with the sea monkeys. I do find it amusing that they are an, a thing because that seems like a pretty good joke. They don't look quite as monkeyish as I would have expected the sea monkeys to look. But they are later on, they are attributed as the reason why these weird waves keep happening which I find really interesting. And I'm just like, how exactly does that work? And Usup is continuing to repair the ship because once again, they have sustained some damage and they're in midair by this point, I should mention still. And the flame that is keeping our poor octopus friend inflated goes out. So they've lost fuel. And that's when they begin to plummet earthworm earthward. I've said earthworm earthward again and i was just very saddened for the fact that they are always just plummeting it just feels like these guys have done enough dropping from like hundreds of feet into the air and they can't get a break and i hate this for them so they have a couple of strange encounters there's first the whole thing with the wave and the sea monkeys that are chasing them then we jump to this town and I don't think we actually get a name for where this is or if it's supposed to be all happening back in the town that they had just left, which that might be what it is. But there is a fight going on between um, the hyena who... I thought we had seen the last of and seeing that he was like sort of back and still a factor surprised me. And the dude who looks like he is from Aerosmith, um, Sar Sarkis, Sarquis, Sarquis, I think it's Sarkis. Um, but Bellamy 
is getting punished by this dude who is making Sarkis do the stabbing of him with a really weird knife that's got like a strange bent end. It's like, I want to say the tip is bent, but after the bend, there's like another seven inches of metal. So it doesn't feel like the tip. It feels like, you know, two thirds of the way down. But yeah, so I I love this too. The fucking um, Doflamingo is like, you've, you know, embarrassed me and tarnished my symbol. And he puts his hand on the like smile face with the line through it. And it's one of those moments of just like, oh, yeah, wow, really tarnished that fearsome symbol that certainly is very impressive and would not have. (sighs) Dude, I'm sorry, but you are not. (sighs) It's not his fault. It's not his fault. Your symbol sucks and you suck. Your, Your power, I will grant you is extremely terrifying and I hate it. Anyway, he basically is like, Bellamy, you were supposed to, and he says this thing and it's in, in the subtitles, it was sort of weird because he's talking about the gold and he says, I don't care about that. You're to twist people around by taking advantage of differing opinions. That's what I told you. Wasn't it Bellamy? And I wasn't really understanding what he was trying to say here. And we may not actually be told yet. It might be that this is just giving us a hint of of the people that he's putting in place and why. But it seems like what he's suggesting is that Bellamy was supposed to just sort of rouse discontent in general where he was stationed. And I don't like differing opinions and just starting fights with random people aren't the same thing. So I can't tell if Bellamy was like doing a good job at that until Luffy showed up or if he just straight up was not really taking his job seriously at all. And then Luffy showed up and I'm curious about that because granted this punishment, like I'm not mad about it because Bellamy sucks And I was a little sad to see him pop up again because I just really didn't like him to begin with. So the fact that he gets taken out here suited me just fine. But it is pretty rough to, like, make this other dude do the job instead. Bellamy asks for, like, a second chance and is saying that he'll follow him loyally and just, you know, I never went against your principles. But again... I'm not really even sure what it was he thought he was accomplishing there, but it just seemed like he was out prodding and poking at people to try and start trouble, which maybe was the point. Maybe that was the job. Um, So anyway, it ends with uh, him saying, yeah, no. And just letting the, uh, let's see, a new era is around the corner do as you wish, but I don't need you anymore. And then he flicks his fingers again so that this dude delivers the killing blow. And it was sort of weird. I'm like, well, then why do as you wish? You're not saying do as you wish because that's not what he's not going to get to do that because you're killing him. But okay, it's fine. Um, and we cut right from them back to our crew and as far as I recall, I don't think we go back to Doflamingo much again in this, like, trio of episodes. Our friends on the sea are spotting this other ship that is heading toward them. The ship has no sails of any kind. It has no flag. And... When Usopp zeroes in on the crew themselves, they are just sitting on the deck without working or doing anything to try and, like, get the ship on a particular course. They're literally just laying around. And all of a sudden, 
these sea monkeys pop up right behind Luffy and company and come heading at them with this giant fucking wave. And they are trying to get out of the way by rowing really hard, which um, I had forgotten that they even had oars, but evidently. And they come up right against this ship. They're like passing right next to it, which has like a frog as its figurehead. And Luffy is trying to warn them that there's a giant wave and monkeys that are coming at you and you need to get out of the way. And one of them says, oh, look, an enemy ship. Let's get their treasure. This Really? Somebody has to be like, I, there's, there's a wave? I don't know if you can see it, but we're going to drown. And the other one says, we can't let that ship get away. And I'm like, genuinely, dude, what do you think you're going to do? What is the, really? This is very funny, though, because as much as it feels like an absurd thing, y'all, we have all worked at a place, right? That has this kind of person in it whose focus is on entirely the wrong thing. And you're just standing there like, that. that's the thing you want to focus on today? We are short-staffed by six people out of 20. You have overbooked the table so we can't seat everybody. Two of the specials are already 86 and service has only been going for an hour. But you are worried about how I didn't vacuum the dining room. That's the thing that you want to pull me in the back and yell at me about. Wow. Okay. Definitely important. And I just felt this in my soul. It was the kind of moment that I, I just thought, oh, fucking people like this. It's so easy to just be like, that's ridiculous. Nobody would have that messed up priority. They will, though. They will. People are just fucking idiots. So our crew is watching them going, what the hell? These guys are so unorganized. And a dude yells like, we need orders. We need cap a captain to tell us what to do. We don't have a navigator. There's like a shot that gets fired and nobody even knows who's firing it. Throughout all of this, our crew is like, oh, and I guess these guys aren't on our side because they're talking about stealing our shit. Even though we're trying to do them a favor by warning them about this thing, they do not care because they have their their shit is a complete mess um so these guys wind up getting sunk and i mean they get sunk sunk they they go to the bottom in a way that feels like they're heading towards a portal to hell there is a dark patch in the center like a black hole and we just see the sea monkeys like circling around them and the sea monkeys take off they are not back after this and i kind of i'm assuming that they just sort of wanted to like sink a ship and it didn't really matter which of the ships they sunk but they don't eat the guys there's no indication that like they get anything out of this it's just sort of a prank a practical joke that they enjoy and not like they get anything out of it otherwise. I thought that they might eat the guys. I thought that they might steal something off of the ship or that there might be some like even larger creature that it was going to turn out they were sort of working for or in conjunction with. But they just circle it as it's sinking and seem extremely excited about it. And that's all that happens. And That made me particularly afraid of them, to be honest, because anything that just does fucked up stuff for the fun of the fucked upness of it is really intimidating to me. I find that really scary. You just can't predict what something like that is going to think is funny. And sinking an entire ship full of men, even if they were bad men, that's uh, really quite a stance to take that it was just a bit of a lark. Anyway, they ask Robin, who is up in the crow's nest, if she sees anything. And she's like, oh, yeah, there's been an island in view for a while now. 
And I love how Usopp and Luffy are both like, well, why didn't you say something sooner? And Luffy being infuriated by this is particularly galling because you guys all know how absolutely useless Luffy can be when it comes to creating any sort of hierarchy of importance of facts to share with his friends when he has information at all. So him being like, I can't believe that you wouldn't tell us. I'm like, Luffy, bruh. If we went back through the previous 200 episodes and added up every incident of you knowing something hugely important and relevant and not saying anything until you were halfway through dinner, I don't think you'd like that list. But apparently there's a bunch of fog around it so they can't see it very well, which I found an interesting detail because when we get to the island, there's no fog at all. And I'm not certain if it's supposed to be that it just sort of is surrounding the island, but not actually there. I don't know. Um, but they land and it's this wide open area that has uh, a, it's like grassland with these extremely tall, narrow trees that almost look like cypress trees. But if the branches didn't start for you know, a hundred feet off the ground, something like that. And Luffy is so excited about it because every place that they have landed otherwise has been pretty dense jungle forest or already populated with a complete village and everything. And this is something that's very new to all of them. So Luffy, Usopp and Chopper just like straight up jump off the ship onto the shore with total excitement they are not being cautious in any way and nami is being cautious but when she says something out loud about the fact that these guys just don't seem worried zoro is like well we have a very clear view of everything and if we can't see it from here then there can't be any danger which is really funny because a minute later there's a giant tall bear walking by and I'm like, you know, you all saw this thing. He's as tall as the trees and he's a bear. And there's nothing to prevent you from spotting him. But apparently he is upon them before they even notice or can do anything about it. And I was like, well, this just seems like you guys all have bad judgment. So Luffy jumps on this bear's back, which I was already like, are you? Are you really? And then all three of them jump on its back. And they're extremely lucky because the bear just shakes them off and gets irritated. But I was particularly surprised at Chopper. Chopper is also an animal that lived in the wild. And I feel like Chopper should know better than any of these humans how disrespectful that is. It just seems like a really, I don't know. It was like, just, you don't just jump on a guy who's walking around minding his own business. What the fuck? So anyway, as they're up there, Luffy sees what looks like a, like red pepper, but it turns out it's just a really long apple and he eats it without any compunction because that's what he does. But it just turns out to be no problem. There's no danger to it. It's just really long. And that winds up being the theme of this island is all of these animals are super long. And the, the way that they are long varies wildly. Some of them have extremely long bodies. Some of them have extremely long necks. Some of them have extremely long heads from side to side, but their bodies are a normal length. It's a very random thing, it seems like. And it even appears like they are continuing to get longer as time passes. Like the, the island is somehow affecting the length of them continually and we find out later that there was a guy on stilts and the stilts continued to grow longer as he was on them so there is something extremely strange going on here and 
the the reasoning that the man gives is that the island is very dull and everything grows long because it's longing for something to happen for adventure what i find funny about this is not just the absurdity of that pro- proclamation which he makes with total confidence it doesn't seem to be a theory it seems to be the thing we're going to go with it is also the 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 joke of it and then being long because they're longing for things works in english but I have to assume it also works in Japanese, even if the wording is slightly different. And I'm interested in the fact that they are both able to make that seem to work. Unless it's a really different thing that he says in Japanese, it might be. I don't know how relevant the reasoning for things growing long will ever be to the story. You know, it may just be a little throwaway joke and it never really matters again. But I was curious as to whether, cause that's like a bit of wordplay and wordplay a lot of times doesn't work from language to language. So I'm just really, I want to know whether or not that's a direct sort of translation and how that works. Um, but anyway, so yeah, one of the dogs, Luffy, like, has it uh beg which means that it like sits up on its hind legs but its body is so long that they can't even see its head once it's up back on the shoreline robin sees a reflection of a ship on the water i found this very confusing and i don't it doesn't matter in the end but it's treated as if that reflection is a precursor to the foxy pirates that land, but they show the like reflection shows up very small, seemingly beside the ship in a way that if it's like approaching from behind, I don't even understand how that would happen. And I thought it was kind of weird to include at all because it's not necessary that she spot it ahead of time. She doesn't do anything to prevent them from landing and her being able to see like, I just didn't really, oh, Gus says it's like in the fog. Is it? Okay. I'm going to just play it again one real quick as I'm watching now, because it, that really looked like it was meant to be like a reflection in the water, but okay, I guess. Well, okay. I, I think that you're right, Gus, but I think the animation is really below par for that moment because that doesn't look like fog the way that they did that that looks like ripples in water so that it makes more sense for it to be what you're saying so i think that is it but even re-watching it knowing that's what it's supposed to be it does not look like that but i appreciate that because i really was like how would that even work down in the uh in the main part of the ship sanji is like we should really get off and get a bunch of supplies because there's got to be some stuff around here and we need food we need to just restock on a lot of stuff so they the other three have gotten to this house and they're looking around inside usap of course wants to stop luffy from just walking in but Luffy, who has never known a day of common sense in his life, just enters. The place is actually, considering it's supposed to have been, like, abandoned for 10 years, is in excellent shape. But there's nobody here. They step outside, and there's this uh, bamboo that the stalks are, like, so high they can't even see the tops. And they're moving around. And this is what we find out later are the stilts and this is like a weird thing because the guy walking around the bamboo isn't lifting and then hitting the ground again the bamboo is just moving as if it's in water or something it's just sliding which i found really puzzling like the whole way that this is set up is really weird there's also this uh pretty white horse that's hanging around and 
it turns out that there is a guy up on these stilts. When they ask, like, what were you doing? He was like, I've always been a stilt enthusiast, which is one of the funniest lines in this entire show. I don't know why that's so funny to me, but the idea of being a stilt enthusiast is so... I just can't imagine, oh, like, that is such a weird niche hobby. And how do you even, like, partake in it, at, like, in an ordinary day? And you're like, hey, I'm just going to go take a spin around the block in, on my stilts. Like, I know that this is something people do, but how? What do you, they, how does it, how do, do you have, like, stilt clubs that you go to and you all walk around on stilts? You know, there's like a whole section of Cirque du Soleil where they're on stilts and doing acrobatics. And oftentimes they use like trampolines and stuff along with it to sort of assist. But it is truly wild. And the fact that this guy is just, he got up on them and was already a little bit too afraid to try and get back down again. But then they continued to grow for just reasons. They, they are not actually, like, buried in the ground. They don't have roots or anything. They just grow because objects apparently grow also. I mean, bamboo was once alive. And I guess that's supposed to be enough. But by that logic, their ship should get longer because trees were once alive and it's made of wood, you know? Anyway, um... This dude is, like, grateful to Luffy because Luffy, in a reaction that, you know, he often has, he attacks the bamboo because it's moving around and seems to be coming after them. And it turns out that this dude couldn't bring himself to get down off of the stilts because it had gotten so high that he was, like, freaking out. So the story is supposed to be that he was up there for 10 years. On the stilts, which, um, sure, why not? Why not 20? Go for it. Why not 100? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Guys, I think I'm, I'm just out of luck today on this recording. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> um... So th this is the moment where the foxy pirates turn up and the, what they do is they have these two huge chains with like paw shaped sort of anchors almost on the end of each. And they fling them out to land on the beach on either side of the going Mary. Thus they trap their ship in place so it can't leave. And these guys land and approach Luffy and this old man. Now, it turns out that this horse is named Shelly, which is such a human name that I find it really funny. And I feel like I also said that about Pierre. But because Shelly is supposed to be a lot more dignified and beautiful than Pierre was supposed to be, it's particularly funny. And she is like his loyal horse that just straight up stayed and waited for him to come back down. And I have to say that as somebody who was as traumatized as anybody by that episode of Futurama where a dog waits forever for Fry to come back down and he never does, it's really nice to see an animal actually get rewarded for waiting and get reunited with her master. Which makes the fact that she gets got by a bunch of foxy pirates all the more infuriating. Because they like throw a net and bring her down. Um, and this dude shares with them that he is part of a group of nomads. And the way that the island works, it's like a ring. And points of it are exposed during high tide. But when the tide goes down, there's like a passage that shows up between the islands. And so I think he says every five years, they migrate from one island to another and just sort of let the natural resources regain their equilibrium while they're gone. And he has been up there for so long now that 
his people are far enough ahead that if he waits for tides, it's going to take a little while for him to catch up to them. So this is like, I really enjoy the, the idea here too, that this is like a nomadic people. It feels like they're on the steps of like Northwestern China or far Eastern Europe um far eastern like russia really and the costume that he is wearing is really reminiscent of like nepalese people up in mountains that kind of like look especially their reliance on milk as like a uh, dietary supplement i was gonna say supplement but it's a staple really um felt like it, it all ties in with that kind of vibe. And I always think it's fun to sort of have a, a people that seems like they're themed after an actual group that exists and an actual culture, as long as you do it in a way that doesn't feel hugely shitty. Bernadette is in the chat. Fun fact, the word play is not word play in Japanese. The reason for all the animals grow so long they are able to live freely without feeling any restraint mentally and physically on the great wide plains of this island. Oh, so it's like a uh, goldfish grows bigger in a bigger container kind of idea. That actually makes total sense and is slightly better. I'll be honest than the, like they're longing for something The I get the joke that they're doing, but the, the, idea that they just grow bigger because they have no constraints is something that I find plausible enough that Luffy's reaction of complete like are you fucking serious works better with the their longing for excitement that to me like even Luffy isn't going to swallow that you know um, Florian says this is called the Long Ring Long Land Arc. Took me years to remember that name. So I wanted to mention something that I am going to post in the Discord. And if I forget, somebody feel free to tag me and remind me. There is a commercial, and I can't remember if it's um, if it's like Chinese. I think it's Chinese. And it is for a gum or a candy or something that comes in this long packaging and the commercials are the kind that tell a complete story when you put them together and they're about a woman who falls in love with a guy who has this long candy when the candy that her boyfriend gives her is cut up into small pieces and so she's drawn to the long man Yes, Gus knows the one I'm talking about. And so every time this uh, sexy man with the longer candy shows up, the song that begins playing is Long, Long Man. And then a saxophone chimes in and somebody whispers, Long, Long, Long over the saxophone. And that is every single commercial. And I cannot tell you guys how hard that song was playing throughout this episode in my head. It was inescapable. It was the entire soundtrack. It was delightful, honestly. It suits so well. And the overall story that they come up with when you put all of the commercials together is amazing. And I played it once for Owen and he was just like, how have you never shown me this? This is unbelievable. So I'm going to find it and I am going to post it. There's like a compilation of all of them so that you can just sit and watch the whole story. And I'm going to post it in the discord because I think that you guys are really, really going to enjoy it. It has a twist, which I uh, really, a series of commercials that tells a story, but there's a twist you wouldn't think, but it's done really, really well. And I just... My only regret is that they don't sell that candy here because I want to know what it is. Because <laughs> it's weird. It looks like bubble gum. It looks almost like um, bubble tape. But it seems like it's more like a taffy because they chew it and swallow it. It doesn't seem like they just keep it in their mouth like you do with gum. Anyway, I had to mention it because it was just super, super on my mind. 
So at this point, um, the Foxy Pirates are like, oh, hey, so we're here to challenge you to a game. And it turns out that there is the the captain of them. What is is the, his name just Foxy? Is that just straight up what his name is? He wants to um you do this like particular type of game with them that is a series of challenges and if they lose they lose a crew member or they lose their Jolly Roger and they aren't allowed to fly it ever again. What is the name of the guy who was on the stilts? He like invites them in for something to eat and he has milk that he like put away. And he doesn't think about the fact that obviously that's going to have gone bad. And by the time he opens the thing, it's this horrible, like rotten mass that he tries to pass off as cheese. And they are like, yeah, we're not eating that. And he does that thing where he's like, oh, you young people are too soft. I'll eat it. And he gives himself food poisoning. And if I have ever seen a perfect example of boomers and the economy that is more apt than this one, I can't remember it. The whole like, oh, you guys don't even understand. And then like, you basically shoot yourself in the foot by trying to show how it can absolutely be pulled off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Tonjit. Thank you, guys. Foxy the Silver Fox is his epithet. I don't know if that's his real name. Okay. So, yeah, he gives himself food poisoning in a pretty fun sequence. Then he goes out and he rides his horse and she gets caught up in a net and it's super sad. And But she's, like, very loyal. Waited for him this entire time and is just delighted to see him. And it turns out that the guy who set a trap for this horse is Foxy. And I really enjoy that he's extremely offended at the fact that Luffy does not know who he is. He does not recognize him. He says, don't pretend you don't know this face. And Luffy says, the only thing I know about your face is that I'm going to break it. That's what he says in the in the dub, which I think is super fun. And this guy, like, collapses in grief over the fact that Luffy doesn't know who he is. So, his, so he's got two sort of backups. There's one guy who is called Hamburg. And he is a very tall, very square man with a weird sort of, like, monkeyish face. Foxy himself has a really long red nose in a, a sort of vibe of like, it feels sort of, um, what's his face? The clown, but buggy, but it's like, it, because it's just as unnatural and just as separate from the rest of his skin tone. It's just really weird looking. And he's got these sort of like zigzaggy looking eyebrows and a huge cloak like coat. It's a, it is a coat because it's got sleeves, but it has this huge fur trimmed hood and fur trimmed sleeves. And a, then he has this pair of like breeches is the only word I can think of, but it's got the, the kind of puffiness to the top, the way that men's pants had almost a, uh, like shorts filled with stuffing. And then you would wear hose under them in like the era of King Henry the eighth. It is extremely weird, the whole outfit. And he has like a French accent as well. So, it feels like they're trying to make him sort of like a French caricature, but in a way that is far enough from my understanding of a, like the caricatures of a Frenchman that it is. This is what I find kind of funny is like you go from um, one culture to another and you get to see what the 
the stereotype is that they hold for the same country you hold a stereotype for and how different it is. And he, he has this like very tall, fluffy hair and he isn't wearing a shirt under the coat, but he has this huge set of like medallions and the, the accent that he has it, like I say, it's kind of Frenchy, but it also can go towards sounding a little bit like russian it's very inconsistent so every now and then it comes across as super french and then sometimes it comes across as super like russian mobster and it doesn't seem to know what it wants to be it just seems like somebody was told to do an overall like foreign you know what i mean foreign sound and they just sort of went all over the map with it um so and yeah there's this girl with him who has blue hair, an extremely pointed nose that reminds me of Pearl from Steven Universe. She has a beanie with a giant pom-pom that's bigger than her own head and sort of like makes me think of a helmet, you know, the kind of decoration that you would have on a helmet. A pair of what almost seems like aviator goggles, a bikini top, and then a jacket that's unzipped, of course, so that you get full tip view. And the jacket has epaulets and also has giant puffy, like, fur trim sleeves that are almost the same size as the pom-pom on her hat to sort of, like, tie the whole look together. The whole vibe of both of them is, it, it's very interesting. It's, um... The, the fact that they constantly have to sort of account for the fact that he has a sensitive ego and hates when people don't recognize him, that I found pretty funny and very believable. And I really like that they're able to address it directly because, like, other characters have had the same sensitive ego, but everybody's had to coddle it to a degree that they can't even really address that their boss is like this. But... With Foxy, they can just say right in front of him that he's really delicate and sensitive about it. And he doesn't seem to have a problem with them saying that. I think I may have to wrap this. I'm getting a bouncing, like, error message now. I'm really sorry, y'all. I think I may have to, like, wrap this for now and bring my computer in. Because I, this is, this is, doesn't make any, it's not Chrome, because I see you guys talking about that in the chat. I deleted Chrome entirely and tried just using Safari. Didn't make any difference. My computer was still acting like this. I'm really sorry, y'all. Because there's like a whole other episode to talk about. And I'm not going to get to it. Florence says we're at the finish anyway. We're not, though. I'm only like two-thirds into the second episode. And this is supposed to be coverage up to the end of 209. Um, Gus says, could try Twitch maybe. It's not like it's the computer, you guys. It The application isn't the problem. And I can only imagine trying to hook Switch up to a computer that's acting this slow with only Chrome open is not going to be any better. So, and you know, I have my laptop, but that doesn't have the ports I need to even attach my, like, my microphone to it. I can't even get, <sighs> I am really sorry, everybody. Um, so if you're listening to just the sound of this, apologies it is not going to be complete uh, i appreciate all your patience with being late and everything as well and i'll keep you guys all posted but it may be that i'm not able to do crowdcasts at the beginning of next week either depending on how long it takes to get this fixed because i think i'm just gonna have to bring it in like Rashawn did <sighs> all right everybody well i love you all until next time toodaloo motherfuckers Spoiled Network Podcast.